part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. This is Jason J. Lewis, the voice of Superman on Justice League Action. This is Mark Wayne, writer of Superman Burgoyne. You're listening to The Krypton Report. Welcome to the Krypton Report podcast, Superman of Blue, the man of tomorrow. And with me, flying back from his earth, the strength, that wonderful Superman who can pick whichever Superman he wants to be from his own canon, his own mind, his own earth, Mr. Anthony Desiato from Digging for Kryptonite. Welcome, sir. Ah, uh, thank you for having me, man. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you for joining me. I know when I, when I asked you about this, you were like, man, I just talked this. I was like, ah, we don't have to rush this. Um, I've been wanting to talk this for a while and it's, uh, it's kind of, it's exciting and I look forward to chatting with you because you did do this recently and you do a great discussion, uh, with Ken Marion and I appreciate that. And we'll, we'll try to hit, you know, similar, you'll have similar comments, but then you get to hear me ramble on about it. So I've been wanting to do this episode for about, I don't know, three or four years. It's just. Sometimes it's difficult to get time to watch a documentary. Um, documentaries are not always people's flavor, so it can be difficult. Um, but we're going to be talking about the death of Superman lives. What happened? It was a 2000. Excuse me. Whew. It's been a rough day, people. I'm drinking my bubbly, and it's bubbly. Thank you, Mr. Michael Bublé. My sinuses are all jacked up. We're having a horrible rainstorm. And if you've ever been to Ohio, you know it sucks, period, except for the cornfields. <laughs> but uh, 2015, John Schnepp released a documentary he had been working on, and it tells the story about the canceled Tim Burton Superman from the late 90s. What happened to it? And it is a fascinating – like it's probably one of my favorite documentaries, and I know – Another reason why I want to talk this with Anthony is Anthony is a filmmaker. He did do uh, a documentary-style movie called My Comic Book Country, which I've talked about this before. It's hilarious because I can't remember how I saw the promo for it, but I saw the promo. It was 99-cent rental, and I was like, this looks awesome, and I rented it from iTunes, and I don't really ever rent movies from iTunes, but I was like, this is awesome, and I started that movie. It opens up. And it has the comic book shop, Acme Comics, North Carolina. And I'm yelling at my wife, that's the one, remember, that was by work when we lived in North Carolina that I went to. And she's like, oh, my gosh. And then fast forward, I find Anthony's podcasts on Facebook and Twitter. And I'm like, oh, cool. And then <laughs> one day, like, it hits me. And I put it together that it's the same person. And I'm like, holy cow, this is awesome. Um, <laughs> it all comes together. No, that's right. awesome. I'm so glad that you found – that you found the movie and the podcast and that, that we were able to connect. And yeah, I mean, I, I definitely got a lot out of watching the, the, the death of Superman lives documentary, you know, Superman lives and this, this whole story, this was something that had, you know, been on my radar for a while, but I had never really delved too much into it. And I was planning to do an episode on my podcast that was going to kind of look at unmade projects generally. You know, obviously we would, we would, probably focus or at least touch on the Superman lives. And then the more I got into it, <laughs> it was like, well, this is clearly the whole episode. And yeah, yeah, Ken and I, we had a great time talking about it. And he was so enthusiastic about it. And that really fed my own, you know, my own enthusiasm for it as well. But yeah, it was, it was so fascinating to, to dive into and such a shame that, that John Schnapp passed away. Uh, but you know, he leaves behind uh, this, I mean, this, this really wonderful piece of work that sheds a ton of light on a project that, you know, we, would have only known so much about had it not been for these extensive interviews that he conducted with so many of the principal players. I mean, he got everyone but the actors as far as the interviews. I mean, the fact that he got to interview Tim Burton is awesome. Yeah. Um, and I remember, I think the first trailer I saw for this was like in 2013 or 2014. And I remember the date kept getting pushed out a little bit for its release because it had gotten so much attention that more money had been donated for him to finish it and polish the movie. And I'm so glad that it happened. And did you, uh, how did you watch this when you, when you, when you watched and went through it? 
was through Vimeo. Okay, because I I was a first day pre order, bought the Blu Ray with the extended, so I have all the extended interviews with. I wanted everything possible that he put together for this. Um, you know, all the extended interviews and stuff with everybody is on there, and. There's a sound clip that will be inserted here from – because I watched this again last night with my wife just to refresh, and I got her after uh, after watching it. And it was a blast to watch this with her, and I'll get into that as we go. Um, you know, this uh, – I had, I had the honor of meeting John Schnepp, and when I met him, he seemed off. And I was like, I was kind of bummed because, you know, I'm meeting him at a con and stuff. And everything I had seen, he seemed so upbeat and like a fun, friendly guy. And I met him and he seemed, you know, off. But I was like, okay, maybe it's a long day. You know, whatever. Like it was kind of a bummer. But I'm like, I'm not upset, you know. Um, and then a few months later, uh, he passed. So it kind of clicked like he was dealing with stuff, when, you know. And it was, it was a bummer because I really would have loved to have enjoyed to have talked with him more about just the impact of this and how wonderful of a project it was. And it's a uh, heartbreaking that he did pass and everything. So I just wanted to, you know, say those words for him. But this is one of those movies that I was telling you kind of off mic before it was supposed to be released around 98 was when they were like looking at it. Um, and it's so weird. Cause I told you, it was like 97 is Batman and Robin. That's middle school, you know, I'm 12, um, you know, and I also I moved in 98, so, like, it, it helps shift this paradigm, but then 99 is, you know, my first year of high school, all this stuff's going on, and The Matrix was 99, episode one was 99, because, you know, we, we find out so many people who had worked on art and storyboarding and concepts for Superman Lives would then go and work for the Matrix. And you can kind of see in the art design some of those ideas how they get put into the Matrix. And it's it's just interesting about trying to figure out where this took place because this always felt like it was so far in the past in the 90s, but it really wasn't, you know? I, I know. It's a funny thing because I, I, I have thought about the, the, the period of time that, that this occupies or would have occupied. And I hadn't really thought about it so much in the context of the movies that came after that you just mentioned, but that's a great point. Uh, I guess I keep thinking of it as this, you know, this, this desert in, in terms of, of Superman on the big screen, which sadly we're in again at the moment, but that's a separate conversation. <laughs> but, you know, you have this long period of time where, yes, we did have Lois and Clark on television and we had Superman, the animated series. And in a few years we would have Smallville on television uh, but you know we're we're still years out from Superman Returns, and 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 you know years you know years after Superman Four: The Quest for Peace. So there's this long period where we don't have a Superman movie, and yeah, I mean it's amazing to think that this could have landed there in the '90s. And maybe this is something to say for the very end, but I'll, I'll say it now. Sort of my, my overall feeling about Superman Lives, and, and do I wish it had happened? I think that if it had happened, and it meant that Superman Returns or Man of Steel wouldn't happen, then I'm glad it didn't come to pass. And I, I, I stand by that. Superman Returns in particular, for, for the problems that it has, I'm still glad that it exists. So I wouldn't want to sacrifice that. But if there's some alternate reality, some scenario where we could have had this movie come out in the late 90s and then have still gotten the movies that we would end up getting, I would have loved to have seen this, <laughs> especially now having you know, delved into the documentary and, uh, and, and the audio dramas, uh, which we can talk about as well if you want, uh, sure. and really getting a feel for, for what this would have been like. It's a shame that we didn't get to see it, and I, I mean that. The audio dramas that you mentioned are where uh, a group of actors have performed the script. Now, which script was it? I don't remember. So I have not yet got to hear them. Okay. So it, there, I, I don't have any connection to them other, other than some friendly social media exchanges, but uh, New Verse Creative is, is the name of the outfit that puts on these audio dramas. And they've done a bunch, and they have a YouTube channel and, and Instagram and everything. And it's New Verse, N-E-U, Verse, uh, New Verse Creative. And uh, they did audio dramas of the Kevin Smith script and the Dan Gilroy script. 
So okay, cool, cool. either or both you'll find fascinating. I listened to both before I did my episode on digging for kryptonite and and you know there you get to see the differences between, you know, that initial Kevin Smith script and then what was very close to being filmed. Uh so it was fascinating. I really appreciate them doing that as much as like the Smith script in particular that you know you can find that no problem, but to to actually hear it performed was really cool. Really I definitely recommend that for anyone who if it, look, the documentary does a fantastic job and it gives you a lot, but it's still not the same as actually hearing the story. So I, I really do recommend people check that out if they're interested. I think the documentary gives you a lot, and I'll say this in a way like almost too much because I've watched the documentary since it's come out probably about four times. That sounds about right. Yeah, I've watched it four times now since its initial release in 2015. Um, I watched it when I bought the DVD or the Blu-ray. I got a, a, a um, digital copy mailed to me so I could watch it while I waited for my Blu-ray to arrive. And then I watched the Blu-ray and then I watched the Blu-ray, I want to say about three years ago, and then I watched it yesterday. And I say that because each time I watch it, it helps you kind of figure out what goes where. Because if you – when you watch it and they go down about the – a lot of the scripts, because you have three scripts, and they start, you know, creating art and concepting and all this stuff, and you can kind of, it kind of gets confusing. Okay, what was going to be where, for whose script, you know, and it can be a little overwhelming at times. And then I'll say this: my sum up, much like what you just said, had this come out and we never got Man of Steel or Superman Returns, I don't want it. Had it come out, and we still got those. All right, but I feel like I feel like in a way they didn't want to make Superman. They liked the idea, but it seemed like every screenwriter and everyone liked an idea, but they wanted to do it different. They didn't really want. They didn't know who the character was, why he was. They always wanted to change it to be something else. And I, that's what I don't want to say scared me. And what I found interesting is Nicolas Cage being as huge of a Superman fan as he is. A lot of the things they were talking about and changes he seemed okay with. And I'm like, okay. Because I told Jania when we were watching, I was like, Tim Burton directing a Superman movie with Nick Cage sounds fascinating when they talk about their take. His I feel like in in one respect they they had an idea that could have been interesting, but I wasn't latching on into any of the stories or the other stuff that was being put into the film, like the Brainiac, the way they were looking at Brainiac, or the, or Doomsday, like um, like listening to some of the people talk. It's like you guys aren't even respecting and looking at the source material. You're just like, oh, it's an alien monster. Cool, I'll do this. That's not the character. Um, and that's what kind of bugged me. It's, I get, I get bugged out when I hear creators talk about, well, I want to do my take on X and I'm like, okay. And then they talk about it and you're like, that's not really whatever X is. You're just taking this core idea and you're changing it to whatever you want. You know, I think, I think the closest you can kind of look at is. Batman 89 and Batman Returns because you have Batman 89, which is a Tim Burton film, but it's a little bit more reserved. And Returns is straight up a Tim Burton movie. Like Returns just pops as visually everything about that movie screams Tim Burton. For good or bad, you know, where do you find, where do you fall in just your Burton fandom? Well, actually, interesting you ask me now because on I do a show for my Patreon called Digging for Justice where we look at DC movies across time. And I'm currently in the midst of a four-episode swing looking at those 80s and 90s Batman movies. So as of our recording right now, I have recently rewatched Batman 89 and Batman Returns and enjoyed them way more than I ever had before. As far as Burton generally, to be honest – I I don't have that strong of an opinion. I'm not against him, but I've also never 
really immersed myself in his filmography. There's stuff like Big Fish, for example, that I, I really enjoyed. It's been years since I watched that. Big Fish is an amazing underrated film. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, it's 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 terrific. You know, from what I remember of it. But so I, again, I guess I don't I don't really come down too hard on on either side with Burton. Uh, I appreciate the fact that it's a very distinctive style. But well, I mean, here's the thing, and and it's funny, you know, to hear you talk about the the departures for the character. And I agree. I mean, it's not even though it it utilizes Doomsday and the death of Superman. It does not feel pulled from the pages of the comic. However, I'll play devil's advocate for a little bit because I don't sure. know, especially listening to the scripts performed, it, to me, and I look, I don't know what it would have would have looked and felt like, but at least hearing it and, and, you know, what we got in the documentary, I don't know that it would have been as radical a departure as everyone was maybe kind of worried about. And, and I say that for a couple of reasons. One, Burton himself in the documentary talks about how, you know, he was excited at the prospect of, I don't know, I'm paraphrasing, but not, you know, not doing a dark Burton-esque Superman movie, but, you know, kind of playing in that world. So obviously it would have had the Burton flair, but I, I, I never got the sense that he was trying to, you know, force Superman into that dark Gothic Burton world. I, I And I could be wrong, but I, I, it genuinely seemed like he was, you know, aiming to do something that, still would have felt in keeping with with the world of Superman. Uh, so so that that's one piece. The Nicolas Cage casting, which I'm sure we'll talk more about, that I think for me is still sort of the, the, the biggest hurdle and, and I think the biggest example of, wow, this really would have been a different take on the character. But as far as the characterization and the beats of the story, I mean, there's some weird stuff in there. I think it's in the Gilroy script, script where, you know, Luther and Brainiac merge into Lexiac. Mm-hmm. But look, I mean, there have been other cartoons and comics that have dealt with stuff like that, too. So that even that's not so out there. So I don't know, all in all, and as far as the characterization, I know with the, with the Burton version in particular, it really played more with this idea of Clark feeling alienated. And in that version of the story, he hadn't told Lois his secret yet and, you know, was sort of, you know, dealing with that. But again, I don't know. I, I just, I didn't come away from the, the doc and the, the audio dramas feeling like, man, like this would have been so weird and out there. I didn't really feel that. So I, I don't know. That, that's, I guess, sort of, uh, and I was surprised by that because I, <laughs> I would not have expected that going into the, the process. What I, what I think is interesting is, and Jania pointed out, I was like, it seemed like when the document and Tim talks about it, like, he really is bummed he never got to do it. Yeah, and I I had when they did a few years back when they did uh, the Return of the Cape Crusaders animated film, which was kind of like the sequel films for the Adam West. I was like, you know, there is money to be mined if they would do animated versions of these scripts and these stories, and we have all this artwork that was created and get as much of the I think get Nicolas Cage to voice Superman, which Nick Cage would later go on to voice Superman in Teen Titans Go to the movies. Um, cause I think that's, that's your linchpin for this Tim Burton film. Um, and, you know, produce an animated film based on the script. And, you know, also they could have done Tim Burton's Batman three or, you know, whatever. And do this whole kind of direct to video sequels. We never got, we wanted an animation. I think that would have been a fascinating means to just keep these things alive because the movie is weird. If you look at, okay, Tim Burton, 96, Tim Burton comes off Mars attacks. It would be three years until his next film release. His next film release is really my favorite Tim Burton film just for the visual, the atmosphere, the music. I think it goes a little bit more with the gore I could have done without, um, which is Sleepy Hollow which is 99. And if you look at those two films and kind of think of where he was coming off of and then where he goes, Superman would have been in between those two. Um, Because you look at a lot of the Brainiac designs and stuff, feels more Mars Attacks, which I've only ever watched that movie once and it's been years. And I remember not really liking it at all. And, but I, I, I like Burton's Batmans. I like Big Fish. I liked Ed Wood. I thought Ed Wood was a really good movie. Weird movie, but in a good way. Um, and it, it's just, you know, Scissorhand and Beetlejuice are always, you know, people go back to as well. 
So trying to think about where he was between Mars Attacks and Sleepy Hollow. Because Sleepy Hollow has that Burton-esqueness, but it's not overtly, like, in your face slapping you like Tim Burton. And I do want to point out to listeners, Nightmare Before Christmas was not directed by Tim Burton. He produced it. He wrote the poem it was based on. But he always gets the credit for that. And a lot of people think of that as, you know, Tim Burton. And it's, it's just kind of funny because it's like the one property that he didn't direct. Oh, fair enough. I, I, but I, I could not agree with you more that it feels like such a missed opportunity not to do this in animated form or even in comic book form. That's the thing that's so odd to me about this is that clearly there's some degree of fan interest in this. And, you know, we're at this point now, you know, with both DC and Marvel on the, on the big and small screen with this idea of the multiverse and seeing different versions of characters. So it, it seems like there's an opportunity there. And I agree with you. Animation is perfect because then that does allow you to have Nick Cage do the voice. And that really, you know, ties it all together. And, you know, going back to Newverse Creative, not to make this all a commercial for them, but I really do admire what they do. And, you know, I don't know what sort of traction they get in terms of views or downloads or anything like that. I don't know. But you know, they're, they put this stuff out and it seems like there's interest, uh, you know, among fans. I know, I'll actually, this is maybe more for off mic, but you know, we, you did an episode with me on my show recently on the Supergirl movie. And we talked about the unused treatment for Superman three that would have involved yeah. Brainiac and Supergirl. They just did an audio drama based on that outline. Oh, cool. You know? So anyway, I, I guess my point is that it just seems like there's an appetite among the audience to do something like this. And especially to have someone like Nick Cage attached to it, you know, that gives it a little, a little more weight. It, it would, it would be cool to see. And it just feels like a missed opportunity not to do it. And I don't right. know if it's, it's just something that they've considered, if they've tried, I have no idea, but I, I, I'm with you. I would love to see that. I mean, especially with, you know, the recently Superman 78 comic, as well as the Sam Ham Batman 89 comic book. Um, and if they really wanted to, I mean, if they really wanted people to lose their minds, could you imagine some scene in the Flash movie when he's traveling the multiverse, we get a shot of Nick Cage Superman? I mean, for all we know, it might be in there. I, you know, it's possible. I, and that's I think my it's possible. Thing. If I'm DC, just as an Easter egg like that, I would try to make that happen. Um, so let's look, okay, let's dig into this. Like, there's a lot to unpack and we won't hit everything because I um the documentary is available on Schnepp's uh YouTube. You can search it. I am going to include a link in the show notes for anyone to go and watch it. So we're going to talk as much as we can about it, but it is something to be experienced as a Superman fan, as a film fan, just as a what if and just how far they were in the process, what was created for this and um it's it's fascinating because what's interesting is Colleen – side note, Colleen Atwood, who was the head costume – Academy Award costume designer who was working on this. She would later go on to be the one who creates the first Oliver Queen suit for Arrow, Barry Allen's first Flash costume, and Supergirl's first suit in the TV series. She didn't do every costume, but those three she did do. Um, so that's kind of interesting, just – she didn't get to do a super suit. <laughs> They're in this documentary, so we'll start here. First up, we got to get this out of the way. John Peters. Producer John Peters. Oh, man. Uh, so when the documentary starts, you have Schnepp talking to Kevin Smith, and he's telling them stories about Peters, and it talks to Peters, and Peters makes a comment, like, none of that's true. And my wife looks at me like, who do you think is telling the truth? I'm like, Kevin Smith. She's like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, watch the documentary. Watch John Peters. <laughs> and I'm like, and then think, what's Kevin Smith have to lose? Like, what is what is he protecting? And I'm like, he always seems so candid. So we're watching it, and she goes, she just looks at me. She's like, wow. Peters, wow. I'm like, right? She's like, why does he always want Superman to fight polar bears? Or like, he had, especially when there's the line where he's like, Superman takes his cape off and, like, cuts someone's head off or something, you know? And she looks at me like, and, you know, the audience can't see my face, but she's like, I'm like, that's, that's Peters, man. <laughs> I'm like, now you know the craziness behind this man. It's, it's insane. And, 
you know, I've, uh, I, you know, I followed Kevin Smith for, for many years and I've listened to the podcast and watched his Q and A's and listened to commentaries and all sorts of stuff. And I, I agree with you. It's like, I don't know him personally. I don't know for sure, but yeah, he, he does strike me as being candid, maybe even to a fault at times. So yeah, I, I do tend to believe him, especially since, you know, one of the things that he talks about is how Peters was, was obsessed with this idea of like being a street fighter. Like he talked about his own past, like this rough and tumble past fighting on the streets. And then Peters himself says something to that effect, I think, in the interview with Shep, I believe, like, right? I've been in 500 street fights. I want, exactly. You so, know, I want them to know what Superman's like, you know, being a fight, you know, knuckles, bloody, and beaten, and coming up. <laughs> and I'm, my wife looks at me like, they're not making Batman again. I'm like, I know. And then I look at my wife, and I'm like, why don't you just give us a, a, a story about a hairdresser who's also a street fighting boxer? Because <laughs> that's Peters. Why not just give us that movie? I know, maybe that's just the movie he really wanted. Oh, but you know, one thing I I do want to, I think we do, you know, we owe a a debt of gratitude to Kevin Smith because I feel like him telling that story at one of his Q&As, right? It's on one of the Evening with Kevin Smith DVDs. And it's also a bonus feature on here. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, Where he he talks about the three requirements that John Peters had for the script. (laughs) You know, that really gained a lot of traction and caught fire, I feel, at least within, you know, the, the, the fandom. And so, I, I mean, I could be wrong, but I feel like that was one of the first instances, or maybe even the first, where we got like a lot, a lot of insight into what what this might have been. And I'm, you know, I would imagine that for Schnepp, that was a, you know, a jumping off point. And uh, so the fact that he told that story, I think that really paved the way for all this information that we would get later. I think without Kevin Smith, it probably would have just been one of those things we knew nothing about, really. Yeah, but because he talked about it, and it was such he's such a fanboy, and people talk about him. Do you know Kevin Smith wrote a script for Superman Lives, the Tim Burton Superman movie? What? And then that, I mean, that right there is enough to dive into. Let's find out. So John Peters is going. You know, he talked about how he got the rights to Superman, and I think his name's actually on the credits for producer for Returns and Man of Steel. Yeah, I definitely think. returns. Uh, maybe Man of Steel as well. I don't. But know he had no involvement in it. It's just one of those, like, you know, producer. Uh, but yeah, he had no involvement in it, and I'm I'm like ninety percent sure he has nothing to do with BVS and beyond. Uh, so he has this, and he wants to do Superman. And Kevin Smith has an interesting story about how he got caught up right a script, and. You know, he had to read the script to Peters and, you know, the script's been equated to being like fan fiction. And that I I get that because, you know, I think Kevin Smith's always been strongest when he writes and directs his own stuff or directs like TV. Um, I don't think he has the chops to write for someone else to direct. It's just not his flair. Um, That's no, that's no nod, nothing against him. I just, I think, but. Eventually, we would get three versions of this script. Kevin Smith, which gets discarded as soon as Tim Burton shows up. After he suggests Burton as the director of the film. So he really, yeah. uh, really shot himself in the foot there. Uh, yeah, he's like, I think I signed my own check to depart. Uh, Wesley Strick, who had worked with Tim on Batman Returns, which in a way I felt like Wesley Strick had the least connection to Superman for the script. And then the Dan Gilroy. And the villains were always looked at being Lex, Doomsday, and Brainiac. And I'm like, okay, all right. Um, That's kind of the setup. Now, the casting, for what seems like, you know, because we have casting talk and everything was, first of all, we'll start Brainiac. He wanted Chris Walken. Visually... I like it, but I, but looking at the actors that are in this, Nicolas Cage and Chris Walken have become such parodies of themselves that it's weird to think about being serious. Like anymore, it's so hard to take Walken serious. Well, that, I, you know, that's the thing. And, and again, I don't mean to keep harping on these audio dramas, but they, they, they utilize voice actors who sounded or were able to imitate those actors and in the in the drama of the Gilroy script in particular, when Brainiac starts talking and he sounds like Christopher Walken, it you know it takes you out of it. 
and obviously you don't have the visual element. I mean, maybe if, if you were made to look like Brainy, I, I don't know, maybe it'd be easier to buy into it. But yeah, I mean, I think that would be a little bit of a tough sell, especially now. I mean, I don't know, so, you know, so many years ago, it may, maybe it would have been a little different. I don't know. I mean, that's the other thing too, is that we've had enough instances now of superhero casting choices and announcements that get ripped to pieces, right? People go, I can't, I can't see this person in the role. And then you watch the movie and it's like, oh, wow, like that yeah. really works. So I've, tr- you know, tried to get to a point where I really try to keep an open mind and figure like, well, if someone's being chosen for this role, they have something that the director sees that they'll, you know, be able to, uh, you know, make it believable. And, and there's so much else, especially with Brainiac, for example, with the visuals, like there's so much else that would go into it. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, it, it, that one's, the, the walking one is it's tough to see, but I don't know. I, I keep an open mind. Well, to think, to think of it like this, walk in with Burton, we had... Batman Returns, and then in 99, he's in Sleepy Hollow, but has no dialogue other than some grunts and groans. So just kind of giving you a parameter with Walken and Burton. Um, Next cast, which is funny, is they talked about Kevin Spacey for Lex Luthor, who then, of course, go on to be Lex Luthor in Superman Returns, in which I think Spacey as Lex Luthor is good, but Spacey being held and returns to being a more disgruntled hackman is, I think, what held him back. Um, so we have Kevin Spacey as, you know, Lex Luthor. And this this is right around – LA Confidential had already come out. So, yeah, I'm pretty – yeah, LA Confidential was like 96, I think. Um, and then <laughs> next up – Jimmy Olsen, played by Chris Rock. And I like that idea. Even even Jania was like, yeah, that would have been cool. And, you know, I'm thinking Chris Rock at this time, uh, Lethal Weapon 4, he was shooting Dogma with Kevin Smith and everything. So I'm like, okay. Would have been a little bit of an older Jimmy, but I could definitely see that casting. Yes. What are your What are your thoughts on the Rock, Chris, the Rock? <laughs> yeah, not the, be... <laughs> not the Rock, but Chris Rock. Yeah, the Rock would be a, a really wild departure for the character, even more so than Chris Rock. Yeah, I, I would have to see it. I would really have to see it, but I, I think it could work. I think it could work. I, you know, obviously, and, and that's the thing too. It's funny because you know, you and I recently talked about the Superman movie serials on my show, and and uh, and I know you're getting into the George Reeves Adventures of Superman show. And, you know, even in there, some similarities, but very different takes on the character of Jimmy Olsen, yeah. right? So I, I think there's there's room for interpretation. Now, Chris Rock is definitely <laughs> in an entirely other category, but I don't know. I, I, I never really had that strong of an opinion on that, I, but I would be open to that. I would be yeah. open to seeing what, what he would do with it. I feel like with Jimmy Olsen... There's there's some room there. I think there's some room to experiment a little bit. You know, sadly, in the recent movies, he hasn't gotten any play. And uh, the B, the Batman v Superman thing, I, I guess, is debatable whether that yeah. was really Jimmy Olsen or a CIA agent using the name Jimmy Olsen. In any event, it's fleeting. Yeah. Uh, so like, Jimmy hasn't even gotten play in in the recent movies. So yeah, I don't know. I I, I would be on board with uh, w- w- potentially with Chris Rock. Dang it! You just reminded me. Ah. We just recorded, uh, we talked about what we'd like to see for Superman and Lois season three. And now that we have the big revelation about that, you know, one of the things I had, and I forgot to mention, was Jimmy Olsen coming back into the picture, you know, showing back up, you know, because Supergirl gave us James, which wasn't horrible, but I feel like we are we missed out on Jimmy's life, and now he's like, this super adult, you know, we didn't get to see him rise to being this prominent adult. Um, so that's, you know, even he, he doesn't feel quite like Jimmy, you know? Right. So we really haven't got that Jimmy since arguably Smallville or, um, or Superman Returns right there. Um, so we really haven't had Jimmy Olsen representation recently so you know you're right there is a lot of playability with this character now Lois Lane 
they mentioned that their top pick for the time was Sandra Bullock. I'm okay with this. Janine looked at oh, me. Oh yeah, said, for sure. Yeah. Janine looks at me and goes, "Yes," and I'm like, "Yeah, I think she would have been an amazing." You know, they talked about they uh, were looking at Courtney Cox, Sandra Bullock, oh, and who was the other one? It just left me. I I don't remember offhand. Sorry. It, it just it just blipped out of my mind. Um, dang it, Thanos. But I definitely would have went with uh, Sandra Bullock, and then. For Clark Kent and Superman, Nicolas Cage. Now, one step, I have to put this back into context of when this movie was being made. Um, you know, I think the last time that Nick Cage was like, the serious Nick Cage that, you know, was like when he did um, National Treasure 2. I think after that movie is when he just went... <laughs> And that's when we got what we have now. Um, so, yeah. What? Okay. Let me look something up here because my brain's farting on me. Overall, Nick Cage is not your traditional handsome man, you know. And he he's physically fit, you know, and he wasn't balding at the time when you see him do like this – the the tests and stuff. So he had some hair. So it's like, okay. Um, it's it's such a bizarre choice. We know he's a comic book fan. He's been in Ghost Rider, Kick-Ass. So I'm trying to go back here into his catalog and see where we're at. Okay, so we're... Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, this makes sense. 96 is The Rock. 97 is Con Air. 97 is Face Off. 98 would be Snake Eyes and City of Angels. So that kind of get that's when we really got Nick Cage, the action star, with The Rock and Con Air. So this would have been right in that time. So it kind of makes sense why he would be in your thought. I mean, heck, I'm surprised that it weren't like Johnny Depp for Superman, you know, since you have Tim Burton. Um, and we, like we said, Nicolas Cage was such a huge fan. Um, and we, we, you know, we touched on it, but I just, I, I try to see it and I try to put myself back in that mindset of watching those Nick Cage movies at that time. And it's just, I don't know. Like, I just, it's, I feel like if this movie, like you said, if this movie had gotten made, it might be almost one of those things that you always – kind of the way that when people talk about Batman movies and you always have to bring up, oh, man, the bat nipples, you know. I feel like this would be that on Superman. Like, oh, that one Superman movie. Look what – you know, they did – That's guys, that's not how it always is. Like he's not always like that awkward or whatever, you know. I just – it's just, you know, but who knows? I mean – I could be looking at a giant picture of Nicolas Cage right now on my wall with my other Superman posters right now. Yeah, it's a funny thing. So much like with Tim Burton, and I'm probably in a minority here, I don't really have that strong of an opinion on Nick Cage. Like I've never – like a lot of those movies you were rattling off, I mean I've seen some, but again, I can't say like, oh, yeah, I've seen all these Nick Cage movies. I don't have that strong of an opinion on him generally. Now as far as him as Superman – Going back to what I was saying before about how I, I don't – for the most part, I don't think that Superman Lives would have been the crazy departure that people seem to think it, it would have been. However, I do think that the casting of Nicolas Cage probably is the biggest like flag to plant in the sand of like, hey, we're doing something different here. And when you look at everyone who's played Superman over the years, you know, even some who you know have a, a – a slightly different look than than you might expect. I, you know, Dean Kane, maybe you know. Dean uh, Kane, George, and I'd say Tyler are the three that kind of get have this. There's a there's a similarity to them about as the they look close enough, but not exactly what you would think. Right, as opposed to Christopher Reeve, Tom Welling, and Henry Cavill, like they all have, I, I guess, that more tr- traditional look. But but With even Brandon the ones Ralph. who it's not and, and Brandon Ralph. Ralph, yes. But even the ones who we would kind of put in that, you know, the, the the slightly different look category, like they still 
you know, stick close enough to the typical representation that you would expect, Nick Cage would definitely have been an outlier there. Now, in fairness, all we have to see of him as Superman are those screen tests, are those photos and the little bit of video that's, that's in the movie. But he wasn't, you know, that wasn't him necessarily performing. That wasn't necessarily him in the, 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 the shape and, and the rest of the look that he would have had in the actual movie. So it's hard to judge based on that alone. But yeah, that's t- I mean, it's, it's, it would have been different. That's the piece of this. That I think would have been yeah. very different. And I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's so hard to say, you know, whether or not it would have worked, but I at least could say like, I would have liked to have seen it. I guess that's, that's ultimately what I keep coming back to. Like it would have been, even if just as a curiosity, if nothing else. You know, it's like my wife said definitely when we're looking at, okay, so they have these designs for the suit, the different kind of suits and style that they want to put him in. And we see the test the, the suit test, a couple of them with Nick. And Jania looks at me and she goes, I actually like the logo, the shield symbol. I'm like, yeah, it does look good. It looks like Superman, but just slight enough to know that it's different. Because, um, like, one thing that always bugs me about with Tyler Hecklin's Superman is they haven't gave him his own twist on the on the shield Mm-hmm. That you can kind of point at. And they never did really with uh, Tom Welling either. I mean, you could argue the Kryptonian like eight crusade symbol. But, you know, like for example, people can't see this, but Anthony is wearing a Superman shirt. Go figure. And looking at it, I know it's the George Reeves shirt because of how the symbol is done. Uh, Superman Returns has its own twist on the shield. Even Dean Cain's is a little bit more large and has a little bit um, to it. Of course, uh, Cavill has his own, you know. And then one thing I always respected was in the Supergirl TV show, the way they took out the gold in the background and just used it as a highlight on the symbol, and they tweaked it just a little bit so that when you looked at her, you're like, is kind of her own take on the, on the crest. So you can look at it like, oh, that's Supergirl. But, you know, uh, Tyler and Tom never got that. So I do like that with Nick's suit, you can see it's Superman, but there's a tweak to it that you'd be like, okay, I know exactly what Superman this is if you're just looking at symbols. the uh, So we see a costume. And what... And there's, okay, so there's the first, like, bodysuit test, like a blue bodysuit, and he's wearing black boots, and they put a cape on him, and he has, what I found interesting is, there's actually flesh-colored at the top of the suit, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, Like, right here, and it has, like, a red symbol with nothing behind it, and that's, like, the the picture that was, like, a Polaroid that was snapped of him, like, mid-blink looking to the distance, where for years that was the only picture you saw. And I and I've heard people argue it looks like an action figure with someone's head put on it because of how that costume was. Um and then later we see what would have been his costume at the end of the movie, which is more of a black body suit with the red cape. And then there's a a test in it where he looks like he's wearing a black body suit. And Nick, Nick himself, like in the earlier suits, he's wearing a a long-haired black wig. But on this test, it's his short hair, and he's got a crest on it that is the red and yellow. And it looked like a really good suit right there. Yeah. I was like – and I was really interested. And then later we get pictures of a suit that they're working on, which I don't know where this – like listening to the story and – uh where they were trying to put it, it looks more in line with the way they would do the bat suits. But it's Nick, you know, with a Superman suit on. It's like the picture I sent you earlier when I'm like, are you ready? Uh, you know, it's blue. It has all the, the you know, but it's muscles. And he's has sh- sh- uh, long hair in some photos, short hair. And it looks more traditional, except 
on like if you look at when they take like long shots, he's wearing blue boots, which makes me wonder like what his what his boots were gonna look like or what. And then it looks like a cool suit. Yeah, and no, that's the thing. Yeah, I had the same. I had a similar reaction looking at all of that, and and I, I you know I appreciated that we we were going to get an evolution of costumes throughout the movie, starting from the the traditional one to the you know the the black regeneration suit to this you know black and red you know final one. So yeah, no, I yeah that that's the thing. I mean, there's there's a and I agree with you. I think for a long time there really was just that um, you know that that perception of this based on that you know maybe not the best photo. Uh, of him in the costume. And I think people really jump to conclusions. And look, I, I, let me issue this disclaimer because it's not like I, I'm not sitting here saying, oh, this would have definitely been a masterpiece. You know, the world was deprived of greatness. I don't know. I don't know. I, I wouldn't go that far, but I, I think there was enough worthwhile. And it seemed to be one of the things that I think I always go back to when we talk about this stuff is the intention behind it. And the sense that I've gotten, maybe let's put John Peters to the side for a moment. But, you know, when you look at what well, was Kevin Smith or, and then later Tim Burton and, and, and Nick Cage, it seemed like it was a well-intentioned. Now that doesn't always yield the best product, right? And talk about how Nick Cage is a big Superman fan. You know, we've seen other superhero movies where the actor and or director are big fans and it doesn't translate to a great movie. So that's not everything, but again, it, it seemed like they were coming from a good place. There was some interesting stuff there. I, you know, I, I I just think it would have been interesting to see. You know, one of the one of the interesting parts in the costume design is when you hear Nick Cage in one of the, the behind the scene videos, like they're picking on the trunks about being. He's like, yeah, I wore the underwear on the outside. That's that's my wonderful Nick Cage impression. Um, speaking of impressions, I watched. Have you ever seen Andy Samberg from Saturday Night Live do Nick Cage? Probably at some point. There's two instances. One is where he plays a young Nick Cage auditioning for Marty McFly. Is hilarious. And the other is when it's the daily update with Andy Samberg playing Nick Cage with Nick Cage next to him. Oh. Supposedly <laughs> as his Nick Cage clone. And there's a line where they say it has all the staples of a Nick Cage movie. One, the dialogue is either whispered or shouted. Two, something's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I thought about that because we watched that after we did this about, you know, just Nick Cage's – where his acting has come from. But that was a side note. So the costume, you know, we have – and one thing to – and I want to bring up is that Tim Burton said, nothing was ever finalized. And I think that's the most intriguing part. Unlike there's supposed to be a documentary that's being made about Superman – or uh, sorry, Justice League Mortal, which was the 2005 Justice League film. And there's costume tests online. There was casting. They were about to shoot. I mean everything was finalized for go, and then it was canceled. And I, I really hope that documentary comes to light because I'd love to see a detailed documentary much like this for that film. But, you know, the reason I bring it up is because that movie is like the second example of almost being there and being canceled. And there and they were finalized this. And that's why it's so interesting to talk about, like with the costumes and everything is. Nothing was finalized because there's costume tests and then there's photos of costumes that we're not sure which one would have been used because they talked about the underwear on the outside and like how to break up the color and do something different. And so it's it's just it was a very fluid process. Three scripts, um, and nothing got finalized. Burton said they even you know Nick Cage even refers to it as being something like a, a fairy tale. To remember that, and with the bad guys, we not a lot was given on Lex. Really, in the documentary, Lex isn't talked about very often, but Doomsday is, and. You know, there was a concept art of Doomsday being built out of many faces. Yeah. And that was the one I was like, no, that is – that's <laughs> more – like that's something like you're not making a Superman movie. Like, I don't know. When I look at a movie, okay, if I told you I'm making a Superman movie 
it's I want to bring the best of what's already been done to the big screen because this is the one thing that's going to apply to most audiences, most people, and you want it to be truest to the character. You want to take some liberty, but you want to be you want to be able to hold that up as like if you got one thing for Superman, this is it. You know, you don't want to hold up like, okay, this is a version of this character from this comic that's well known, and that's not really how it is everywhere else, but that's okay. You don't have to explain it. Um, You want to be able to hold it up as like the gold standard for your character. That's just how I take it when you do a movie. Compared to a comics, we're allowed, you know, endless opportunity and options. Yeah, I mean, look. I'm on record. I'm a big fan of of Man of Steel and BVS and and Snyder's Justice League. But I'll I'll admit, at the end of Batman v Superman, we get a version of Doomsday. And I know you know the, it continues to evolve even during the fight. But you know we never get that traditional comic book esque depiction on the big screen. And you know does it ruin the movie for me? No. But at the same time, if we're going to do and it's like, I don't know where Snyder was going in the future. Maybe he was planning to do a, another more faithful depiction of Doomsday in another film. But but if not, it's like, if this is our one chance, <laughs> you know, it would have been cool, especially for, for me and the connection that I have to it getting me into comics and Superman. It's like, yeah, it would have been really cool to see that fully brought to life. And, uh, you know, it, it it's it's interesting when we talk about Doomsday and the death of Superman because for as monumental and historic that storyline was in the comics – We've still not gotten outside of the animation, but we've still not gotten like a like a proper live action depiction of that. So we've gotten elements of it here and there, right? Smallville tried their hand at Doomsday. The less said about that, the better. <laughs> yeah. You know, there was a version of Doomsday on Krypton, which I've not watched yet, but I will by the end of this year. But of course, that's pre Superman, so you're not getting that's that visually that looking effect. Doomsday. And I can't wait to I can't wait to dive into that. Um, that that should be cool. But you know, so here and there we get you know we get aspects of it. So yeah, the whole thing about all the faces it's a cool idea. But at the same time, would I want that at the expense of the the more faithful depiction? No, I, I would like to see Doomsday brought to life from the comics as closely as possible. However, in in the defense of Superman Lives, at least they were attempting to do you know they weren't getting into the whole reign of the Superman portion of the storyline, but they were doing a death and return story, which, you know, again, we've still not gotten, you know, truly, uh, yes, in the Snyderverse, he died and came back, but we haven't gotten that full death and return story. And and even Superman Lives wasn't fully that, but at least it was, you know, getting us closer. It reminds, it reminds me a little bit more of like Superman Doomsday, the animated movie where it's like exactly. condensed. Yeah. Um, there was the other big version of Doomsday talked about where like, the dude was like talking about it had a energy core that was like lighting up in its chest and propelling it. It had four arms and the four arms thing didn't bother me too much, but it was like the whole way it was like an energy being like inside of it. I was like, and eh, no, that doesn't really track for me. Well, like here, here's the thing. And I, I know where, where you and I would land on this, but to kind of go back to something you were saying before, for the the filmmakers and the concept artists who are, who are putting this together, it's like, yeah, what is the objective? Because if it is, hey, we're trying to faithfully adapt this comic book storyline, well, that's one thing. But if it's, hey, we're telling the story about the death and return of Superman, there's this monster that kills him called Doomsday. Like, come up with some designs. It's like, I, like I understand if if they didn't feel beholden to the version that we know from the comics. Again, I I would like to see that, but. You know, I, I I can get the the instinct to try to, you know, put a different spin on it. I suppose. Um, you know, you talk about it, and this is just a quick side note, but I'm over the death of Superman storyline trying to be done because they've, but I think doing it on something like Superman and Lois, where you could space it out and kind of build that tension, much like they did in the comics, where. Doomsday pops out, he's moving across country, and then you could take your time to explore the aftermath would probably be the better way to go. And maybe, you know, down the line another two or three years, if the show continues that long, you know, that could be a season arc or something. You know, the first six episodes, eight episodes builds up to it, and then you've already got Superboy and Steel in place. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, 
I think that would be probably a better way to get a more faithful adaptation. And the Eradicator, a different version, but nevertheless. No, that's the thing. I, I agree. I feel like Superman and Lois, if we're ever going to get it, that's the ideal vehicle for it. Because I think where the animated adaptations have, have stumbled, and I really did like the Peter Tomasi written uh, Death of Superman, and I like the Rain, of, the Rain uh, follow-up movie as well, because uh, at least there was more space and more real estate to tell the story. But I feel like where they still stumble is that Actually, I have to walk that back a little because I was going to say we didn't have as much time with those versions of the characters, but I do recognize that was part of the, the, the DC animated universe at the time, and that was the version of the character. So I guess I take that back a little bit. But I still feel like something like Superman and Lois, where you've spent all this time with the characters, you don't have to introduce everyone all of a sudden. Yes. It's like we, we, can, we can build towards it. However, I don't think Superman and Lois will ever do it, I, and I love the show to death. But I feel like <laughs> they'll tease that they're doing it and then <laughs> get another one of their classic uh, bait and switches. That's why I say they'll do like, you know, season six or something when, you know, a lot of the original creative team has moved on and they're like got new people and they're like, let's kill him. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. But so much of this movie, you know, Superman lives and w- is based on the concept of a different take. And sometimes that can be a positive, and sometimes that's just an excuse to take something and do whatever you want with it and not really hold true to to what the core of the character and why people like the material in the first place and why it's what it is. Um, one thing that we've, we'd never mentioned was, I guess, there was a script for a while by Gregory Pure, Pure called Superman Reborn. Mm-hmm. That's what Kevin Smith saw. And then he was like, let's call it Superman Lives. And then he wrote his script. So I think that's interesting. Like, what was that script like before? Like, where did that fall into place? Um, well, so I was – so, well, I, two things. One, it's, it's funny to hear, you know, Kevin Smith kind of knock that script uh, because when he was replaced, he would hear similar criticisms <laughs> of his own. So there, there's that piece of it. <laughs> Got to keep the five-year-old happy. But no, no you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, so, you know, so that's one thing, the fact that, uh, you know, his own work would be knocked by, uh, you know, by, by the filmmakers after, after they decided not to use his script. Um, but then the other thing is I was doing a little, uh, a little extra Wikipedia research before we jumped on this, and there was an entry for Superman Reborn. Now, I don't know if the script – not an, not an entire page, but there was a little paragraph about it. I don't know if the script is out there or, or what, but one of the things, at least in one version of Superman Reborn, was that as Superman's dying, because it's still it was still the same idea of he dies and then there's a return, but that as he's dying, like his soul leaves his body and enters Lois, and she becomes pregnant with their child. So that was a, a, allegedly again Wikipedia. You never know for sure, but that was how, one, one piece of information. Made. And then I think I feel like Kevin Smith in either the Q&A or in the documentary, I can't remember, talked about uh, the reborn script, having Superman um, like on a therapist's couch. Like he was he yeah. was getting he was going to therapy. I think that was a piece of it. So it was I don't know much modern, more beyond that. They say. Um, yeah, it's it is interesting that. Yeah, that uh, that wouldn't fly. But anyways, you know, the other big villain was Brainiac. And I think there is more in the documentary about the Brainiac S because we got to you get to talk in the documentary with people who are hired to create monsters and creatures for Brainiac's ship, you know, for one version of the script talked about that when Krypton exploded, all these other Kryptonian colonies popped up and monster you know, I'm just like, okay, that's super bizarre, but whatever. And it's interesting because you saw a lot of artwork for concepts that you were of what Krypton was going to be. Uh, Brainiac was going to be like a head in a bubble who wore a cape and was actually like had spider looking legs underneath it and didn't have like a full body. And I think in some ways that could have worked. Um, you know, they, they showed him later. They had the concept of like a inspired by like a King Cobra for his head and his look. And. I think that could have worked, but at the same time, they never talked really about how Brainiac fit into the story, you know, and they didn't really talk about him bottling cities and stuff like that, which is 
really what Brainiac's about, you know, or, you know, taking a planet's knowledge. So they really, you know, I know you've listened to the audio dramas and stuff, but they've never really explored, like, in the documentary about what Brainiac's part in the story would have been. I mean, essentially, in the... And I think I still have these straight because it was it got a little confusing for me too after after you know listening to both of them and just keeping straight what was the Smith script and what was the Gilroy script. But I believe in the Smith version, it, you know, the movie opens with Brainiac in space searching for the Kryptonian, right? And whereas the Gilroy script opens with the destruction of Krypton, and Brainiac is responsible for the destruction of Krypton, and he's like hunting down the Els, and of course Kal El escapes, then he vows to hunt him down, and he does. So it's still the same type of idea. But he has a more active role in the destruction of Krypton in the script that would have been filmed. The same type of idea in both cases. Um, I think in the Smith script, it's it's not as fully developed. Like I think he just has Doomsday in his collection of monsters, and he sends him down to Earth, and he blocks out the sun to hinder Superman's powers. Whereas I think in the Gilroy script, there's more of a like a creation of the monster, if I remember correctly. But again, it's the same basic beats. Like he's hunting Kal El, and he is responsible for sending Doomsday after him. Um, and, you know, we, we did see where they filmed or created a model of what the Brainiac skull ship, and it looked more straight up like a skull and everything. And it, it looked cool. And, you know, we, we could go on and on. And the idea is it would have been something unique. It would have been different. Would it have been too far, you know, or would it have been um, close to it? Because the last major player, I would say, of this whole Superman list was the idea of K. Yes. And I and I look at K being, you know, kind of like a Kelix, Kelix, uh, Keylor, you know, I've heard it in different comics. You know, robot that was attached to Superman's shuttle went with him and then would, you know, change, grow, and help him as he grows. And eventually it would be um, you know, like the chamber that would go around him to rejuvenate him after his death. And, you know, what's funny is the last suit that we saw testing for was the iridescent rejuvenation suit. And yeah. so much people have talked about this and seen it and there's tests of it. Um, and they're like, it would have been on screen for like 10 seconds. You know, it was going to be like what he was wearing or had on when he came out of Kilo or K. And then K was going to form on him to be almost like a, a skeleton around him as he was continuing to heal. Um, because a lot of the drawings they showed of like what Krypton was you utilized this kind of metallic exo. Uh, metal exoskeleton type stuff. And I think the concept was cool. You can definitely see where it evolves a lot. Yeah. It, well, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say it, it was, again, going back to just like the photos that get released and then the reactions to them, you know, it, it seems like people were hung up on this idea that like, oh, Superman's just going to be in that suit and flying around in that suit. And it's like, no, like it has a very specific purpose in the film, right? While he's regenerating. But then also with, with K, uh, again, this was – and thinking about the differences between the scripts and, and going back to what you were saying earlier about Kevin Smith's being more like fan fiction. So in the Smith version, it's the Eradicator, Which right? Makes and, sense. That's, and that's what forms the, the suit around him. So what was kind of cool about the Smith idea was you know, we weren't getting the full reign of the Superman, but we had the Eradicator. And Superman in that armor was not all that dissimilar from Steel. So you were sort of getting, you know, a couple of the characters from Wayne of the Superman. The, the Smith script, from what I remember, leaned too much into, like, a buddy cop dynamic between Superman and Eradicator. And that was at least reduced, if not removed, by the time you get to the, the, the later script, which I think was smart. I didn't really like the way that played. Uh, but those, those were some of the differences, I think, in the, in the scripts. Huh. Yeah. I can see that. Um. But the K was, I think, the last big ele uh, element, which to me feels very Kryptonian. It feels like it would have worked being like this personal robot kind of thing that shapes and morphs and he would have used and everything and helped, you know, 
rejuvenate him. So that to me didn't bother me, but that's, and that's the last big point I have, you know, on Superman lives. I think it would have been a fascinating watch. Um, I'm definitely going to seek out those radio dramas now. I'm, I'm interested in, I would love to see this in a comic or in an animated film sometime. Uh, you know, and I think, why not get Nick Cage to voice it? He probably would do it. I mean, that we, yeah, get get someone like Henry Selznick to direct. Since he directed Nightmare Before Christmas, he has similar, uh, if Tim Burton doesn't want to direct another animated, you know, direct a home video feature, um, something like that. And I think, I think it could be something really good. Um I do too. I've, I've, I would love to get an answer from anyone in, in a position of knowledge or authority about whether this is even in the realm of possibility. And if not, why not? Because it really feels like there's an opportunity here. And you know, with with look, we see plenty of things sort of making their their comeback. We see a lot of revivals and reboots, and we see cameos in these multiverse movies. And you know, your mileage may vary on how much you like that. I have sort of mixed feelings on on all of that, but. We're definitely at this point where there there does seem to be a desire and an interest among fans and viewers and readers to to see a lot of this stuff coming together. So I you know I, it's one of those things where I don't know that this window lasts forever, but there's this right. moment in time now where I think there's interest. Someone like Nick Cage, would, I, I agree with you. It seems likely he would do it. It's like I, I really wish that they would. Uh, and again, I, I don't know any anything you know, if it's ever even been considered. But I, I'm with you. I would love to see a comic, if nothing else. But animation feels the way to go. Get that voice in there. I, I agree because the voice is so much of the character. And I mean, look, Marvel did the What If series, and this could be nothing more than if they want to do a short version of this or something. And DC do their own kind of What If. Um with this or, you know, something that would spark these projects for fans like this. And I think that, yeah, animation is the way to go. Um, you, cause Nick Cage, he would do it and he needs money. He'll do anything for money. Basically. I'm gonna try to invite him to my party, my birthday. <laughs> like Nick, come on, buddy. Um, but yeah, thank you, Anthony, for being here and discussing this topic again. <laughs> um, you no, know, my pleasure. To... My pleasure. I appreciate. Uh, I, I know when you originally asked me, I had just done my episode of it uh, on on it for digging for kryptonite, and I I wanted to wait a little bit because I wanted to give you a a, a fresh, spontaneous discussion. I didn't want to, and I, my my fear was if we did it right after I had did mine, af- after I had done mine, that it would have just been you know recycling the same talking points. So uh, and I'm I really glad think... that we waited. This was a lot of fun. I really think it's a topic that we talk about it now, and then if you we do, if I were to do this in like in another year or two. I might have different thoughts on it, you know? I might think, you know what? Just do it. They should have done it, you know? Or I'd be like, no, they shouldn't have done anything. Um, because, you know, watching Tim Burton talk, it seems like he wanted to do it, and he was ready to be a little bit different than just his normal Tim Burtonness. Um, You know, based on he did Sleepy Hollow, then shortly later, you know, Big Fish, and seeing where he was growing as a filmmaker, this might have been in his mind to be the start of a different you know, chapter open and starting something new in his style. So I don't know. Hey everybody. So here's Junia. She just, we just finished watching the death of Superman Liz, what happened. And she's going to give some of her thoughts. Junia. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, I feel like the concept at first was mildly terrifying. Um, I'm sorry, John Peters. I think, like, he is insane. That man is insane. And I know it takes eccentric people to create some really amazing things, but that man is past eccentric. Like, he is, he's in a different world entirely. Um, But God bless him. Um, And I I feel like everybody knew that about him. Um, But... Ultimately, I have to say that, like, I, I feel like I have a better understanding of uh, Tim Burton as a director. He has a lot of um, 
crazy ideas that people would deem as crazy, but actually he has like um a really a really good like uh gut. And I think that it would have been interesting to see where his gut took him with this story. Um, I have to say, I especially really liked some of the uh, concepts that they had for, like, side actors and things like that. Like, um, Sandra Bullock as Lois Lane could have seen that in a heartbeat. I would have loved to have seen her as Lois. I think she would have been great. Um, Even Chris Rock as Jimmy Olsen, I would totally back that. Um, And would love to see him in that role but yeah I think this is more along the lines of like I'm very curious as to what could have been um there were things that I liked when it came to Superman's suit it's very hard for me to get past Nicolas Cage or the idea that Nicolas Cage would have been Superman there are certain instances during this where I felt like I could see him as Superman, but I told Tyler this earlier as we're watching. Um, every single time I see Nick Cage, he looks like a middle aged father who lives next door. And I don't know if I would would have wanted a middle aged father who lives next door as my Superman. No offense to Nick Cage, I think he's a great actor. Um, but yeah, it would have been, even with the way that he looked when he was younger versus now, it would have been very hard to kind of allow myself to go into that mindset of that's Nick Cage as Clark Kent, um, or as Superman. I probably would have been able to see him as Clark Kent, but anyway, that aside, um, It's not just the way he looks, by the way, guys. Like, I'm okay with somebody who looks unique and maybe not, you know, atypical for roles. Um, But I feel like it's also his voice and kind of his demeanor that that I wouldn't be able to get past. Um, God love the man. At the same time, I'm intrigued enough after watching this um, that I would have liked to have seen where this would have gone. Uh, barring John Peters' crazy um, input, um, I, I really feel like that's kind of where things went wrong. Um, and, you know, I love Kevin Smith. I think that he has some really interesting ideas, but I think that he was kind of being a yes man in that moment of like, yeah, John, I'll do what you want me to do. Yeah, you want a giant spider in this? Okay, let's put it in there. You know, um, but I, I don't know if he really was able to kind of um, have the freedom to write it the way that he would have seen it, you know. Um, it would have been interesting. It would have been interesting to kind of have any interpretation of the three storylines, scripts that were available for this. Um it's kind of crazy, but uh, Tim Burton, great director. I don't know if he's a Superman director, but at the same time, I would be intrigued enough to watch it. And I'm a little sad that I can't, because part of me feels like if he did get his hands on this and he actually did the film back then, that today it would be a cult classic. So. Just saying. But that's all we got. Thank you for listening. And remember. We just want to say if you've enjoyed this podcast, please check out other podcasts on the Press Play Podcast Network. Remember to check out Krypton Report on all social media platforms. Go to linktree.com slash Krypton Report. You find all of our information right there. And if you want to keep Krypton from exploding, join our one dollar a month Patreon. That's right, for one dollar a month. You'll get extra special content that you don't get on the main show, like movie commentaries and whatever else comes out of our mouths. So check it out, patreon.com slash Krypton Report. 
If you are like Tyler and James and can't get enough super talk, check out these other podcasts. Digging for Kryptonite, Supergirl Radio, The Last Sons of Krypton, The Superboy Legacy Podcast, All-Star Superfans, Superman the Animated Podcast, The Aspiring Kryptonians, Always Hold On to Smallville, Caped Wonder, The Geek of Steel, and Truth, Justice, and Hope Podcast. Hey, we're going to press pause and hear a few words from our other podcasts on Press Play Podcast Network. Hello, Brooks here with the Books with Brooks monthly book club podcast. Here's how Books with Brooks works. We read one book a month and then we talk about it. Classics like Stephen King's The Shining, debut novels like We Are the Brennans by Tracy Lang, and tons of other compelling, life-changing stories, one book and one month at a time. So come read along with us and then listen in. This is Dan Jurgens, and if you want to have a good time, keep listening to the Krypton Report.